There's a peace I've come to know. Though my heart and flesh may fail, there's an anchor for my soul. I can say it is well. Jesus has overcome, and the grave is overwhelmed. The victory is won. He is risen from the dead, and I will rise when he calls my name. No more sorrow, no more pain. I will rise on eagles' wings before my God, fall on my knees and rise. I will rise. There's a day that's drawing near when this darkness breaks to light and the shadows disappear and my faith shall be my eyes. Jesus has overcome and the grave is overwhelmed. The victory is won. He is risen from the dead and I will rise when he calls my name. No more sorrow, no more pain. I will rise on eagles' wings before my God, fall on my knees and rise. I will rise. And I hear the voice of many angels sing, Worthy is the Lamb. And I hear the cry of every longing heart, Worthy is the Lamb. And I hear the voice of many angels sing, Worthy is the Lamb. And I hear the cry of every longing heart, Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. And I will rise when He calls my name. No more sorrow, no more pain. I will rise on eagles' wings. Before my God, fall on my knees and rise. I will rise. I will rise. When peace like a Sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot, Thou hast taught me to say, It is well, it is well with my soul. It is well. It is well. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear.
is the day when the faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. With my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. Beneath the cross of Jesus I find a place to stand And wonder at such mercy that calls me as I am For as the short days guard me Tell me, come beneath the cross of Jesus, my unworthy soul is one. Beneath the cross of Jesus, his family is my Strangers chasing selfish dreams now won through grace alone. How could I now dishonor the ones that you have loved beneath the cross of Jesus? See the children called by God. Beneath the cross of Jesus, the path before the crown, we follow in his footsteps where promise holds. We gladly live our lives Beneath the cross of Jesus I fain would take my stand The shadow of a mighty rock within a weary the burning of the 
disappointment in their mind. No weariness, sorrow, or pain. No hearts are bleeding and broken. No song with a minor refrain. The clouds of our earthly horizon will never appear in the sky. For all will be sunshine and gladness with never a song nor a sigh. I'm bound for that beautiful city. My Lord is prepared for His own, where all the redeemed of all ages sing glory around the white throne. Sometimes I grow homesick for heaven, and the glories I there shall behold. What joy that will be when my Savior I see. City of gold will never pay rent for our mansion. The taxes will never come due. Our garments will never grow threadbare, but always be faithless and new. We'll never be hungry nor thirsty, nor languish in poverty there. For all the rich bounties of heaven, His sanctified children will share. I'm bound for that beautiful city, my Lord has prepared for His own. Where all the redeemed of all ages sing glory around the white throne. Sometimes I grow homesick for heaven, and the glories I there shall behold. What a joy that will be when my Savior I see in that beautiful city of gold. Who has held the oceans in his hands? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Kings and nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Who has given counsel to the Lord? Who can question any of his words? Who can teach the one who knows all things? Who can fathom all his wondrous deeds? Behold our God, seated on his throne. Come, let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore Him. Who has felt the nails upon His hand, bearing all the guilt of sinful men? God eternal, humble to the grave, Jesus, Savior, risen now to reign. Behold our God, seated on His throne. Come, let us adore Him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore Him. You will reign forever. Can compare. Come.
come, let us adore Him. Behold our God, seated on His throne. Come, let us adore Him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore Him. Come, Thou Almighty King, help us Thy name to sing, help us to praise. Father, all glorious, or all victorious, come and reign over us, ancient of days. Christ for the world we sing, the world to Christ we bring, with one accord, with us the to share with us reproach to dare with us the cross to bear for Christ our Lord O Lord our God to Thee the highest praises be hence evermore Thy sovereign majesty may we and to eternity love and adore. The Savior's presence seems so dear, each step I take brings heaven near.
I want to hear that mighty chorus with this sing. I want to hear that mighty chorus with this sing. To hear that swell and ring. The sweetest song that earth can ever boast was sung when Christ was born. Sad for Lord, He left the earth to send the Holy Ghost to guide us till that morn. They sing in heaven a new song of Moses and the Lamb. I want to call to hear the angels sing, to bid me well, and to welcome me. Fill with 
Glory land is not so far away, and we'll reach it some glad day. Heaven's home is now my final goal, there to live while ages roll. What a glad and happy days will be. to see those who live in misery, but in heaven no more grief or pain, crippled lives are whole again. What a what a life happy days will be, what a what a glorious We travel. 
this earth-shifting sense that transcends all the reason of man. But the things that matter the most in this world, they can never be held in our hands. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I believe whatever the cost. And when time has surrendered and earth is no more, I'll still cling to that old rugged cross. I believe that this life with its great mysteries Surely someday we'll come to an end. But faith will conquer the darkness and death, and will lead me at last to my friend. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I'll believe. Good evening. It's time to begin our midweek service. If everyone could come in and have a seat. Let's start out singing about the lily of the valley. I have found a friend in Jesus. Oh, we are 
Would you stand with me as we sing walking the long day? Walking the long day and the greatest signs of fall. Good evening. Hope you're having a blessed week. For our prayer requests, Mary Williams fell this morning and is at Memorial Hermann the Woodlands Hospital, so please keep Mary in your prayers. For our announcements, there will be a come and go 100th birthday celebration for Violet Weeks um, this Saturday, September 17th from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. in the Chapel Center. Um, contact Eileen Young or Margaret Cottrell for more information. Please join us for a baby shower for Maria Molenbrock this Sunday, September 8th, 18th, sorry, um, from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. in the Chapel Center. And Maria and John are expecting a baby girl, and they are registered at babylist.com. Save the date for the Fall Festival. Um, it will be Saturday, October 8th from 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Make plans to join in the fun. Come uh, by the bulletin board in the foyer this Sunday, um, September 18th, and sign up and volunteer to help with, with food and the fun. Um, and donations are needed of goldfish, crackers, individual serving packs, um, Little Debbies and candies, so please place donations in the box in the foyer for that. The men's luncheon will be this Tuesday, September 20th at 11.30 a.m. at Outback. For our youth, the high school night will be a game night this Friday, September 16th at 6 p.m. Uh, in the Youth Center. And then the junior high night will meet at main event this Friday, September 16th at 7 p.m. The cost is $15 for bowling and then bring uh, any extra money for additional activities you would like to do. 
The Devo will be this Saturday, September 17th at 6 p.m. in the Youth Center. And there will be a youth invasion this Sunday, September 18th, immediately following the evening assembly at Crust Pizza. For our Journeyland rotation, four years to kinder will go to room B208. First and second grade will go to the Chapel Center Auditorium. Third and fourth grade will go to room B201. And then fifth and sixth grade will go to room B207. If you will bow with me, we'll be dismissed for class. Dear Heavenly Father, you are an awesome and holy God, Lord, and we pray that you help us to, to never forget that, Lord. Um, as we come here together as a family and, and go into our time of study, I pray that you would just help us to focus on your word and, and to learn more about you and grow closer to you and become more and more like you, Lord. And we just, our aim is to be pleasing to you, and we pray that we can do that. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. You're dismissed. All right, we good? I'm on? <clears throat> well, good evening. Hope everyone's having a good day and good night. <clears throat> you all showed up. I, I was, I'm glad to see that. Uh, Jordan said we'd be alternating weeks, and I uh, wasn't sure anybody was going to come, so thank you for, for being here. Um, if you weren't here last week, um, we are in a new series. We started a new quarter last week, and we're going to be talking about the book of James. Um, a series of lessons we've entitled A Blueprint for Living Out Your Life of Faith. And if you weren't here last week, uh, last week uh, my brother Jordan taught the class. Um, we're going to be co-teaching this quarter. Um, he came to me a couple months ago and, and, and asked if I would help him. Uh, I put that in quotes because uh, help meant teach half the classes, but here we are. Um, so we're going to try this co-teaching thing out. If it, if it goes well, uh, that's good. If it doesn't go well, we can blame Cleo. Um, but we're talking about the book of James, and today's lesson is a testing of faith. Um, like I said, Jordan talked a little bit about the, the book as a whole, gave us a little bit of an introduction, um, talked about some of the themes we're going to be diving into, and we're definitely going to be hitting on several of those. Um, but I do want to address real quickly... Um, um, a lot of people throughout my life have told me that uh, me and my brother look alike. And I know we're brothers, but we've been asked several times if we're, if we're twins. Um, we are four years apart, um, but I can uh, say that I, I can understand where people would get that. Uh, but just, just in case you ever get confused throughout this uh, class and you can't tell us apart, um, a little easier reminder is he's a little bit shorter and a little bit uglier. Um, so that's the best way. To, to tell us apart. But we're talking, like I said, um, the first part of James in James chapter 1. Anybody know what these are? And if you're thinking yellow kumquats, you're close. No, they are lemons. And we've often heard the phrase, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. You hear this a lot, you've heard it your whole life, 
And it's a phrase, it's a saying that shows the idea that life provides us with numerous opportunities. Some of those opportunities are negative, and we are to try to turn those negatives into positives, turn those sour lemons into sweet lemonade. Um, but I have to be honest with you, I've never really liked this phrase. And there's two reasons why I've never really liked this phrase. Uh, the first thing is this phrase is overly presumptuous. And I typically don't like things that are overly presumptuous. And the reason I say that is, is it presumes that you have all the other ingredients at your disposal. You can't just squeeze a bunch of lemonades and hope for the best. Um, you have to have enough water, you have to have enough sugar, enough lemons. You have to have this exact plastic pitcher. It doesn't have to be red, but it has to be the pinch top. We've all had one. And you have to have a wooden spoon to stir it or it just doesn't taste right. We all know this common knowledge. But the other reason why I've never really liked this phrase is I don't necessarily like being told what to do with my lemons. I want to hold on to my lemons. I want to save them for later, put them in a box. I want to share my lemons with other people sometimes. I want to talk about my lemons on Facebook. Sometimes it feels easier to accept that my lemons are just a part of who I am. But then there are other times when I do my best to try to get rid of my lemons. I don't want anything to do with them. It's, a, it's harder uh, to try to make lemonade out of my lemons than it is to just get rid of them altogether. And I jest about this, but this concept that we're talking about is very biblically based and uh, takes up a good part of the first part of the first chapter of the book of James. This phrase actually has a pretty interesting backstory. I, I got caught up falling down a, a rabbit trail, kind of digging into this a little bit. And in the early part of the 1900s, there was a stage actor uh, slash silent film actor, a humorist. He did a lot of different things. Um, but his name was Marshall Wilder. Marshall P. Wilder. You may have heard of him. Um, he had a very successful acting career, but he was unique in the sense that he was a dwarf actor. Um, but despite that, he had a very successful career. And in 1915, when he passed away, this is what was written in his obituary. It said, his was a sound mind and an unsound body. He proved the eternal paradox of things. He cashed in on his disabilities. He picked up the lemons that fate had sent him and started a lemonade stand. And from everything I could gather, this is the first time that this concept was ever put into print. Now, obviously, this phrase has been modified slightly over the years, but the idea behind it remains the same. It's the idea that we are not only to overcome our obstacles, but we are to cash in on our obstacles, use those obstacles to leverage a positive outcome. Mr. Wilder, um, like I said, had a very successful career, and he did not allow the obstacles of his stature to define who he was, but rather he became defined by the success he had in spite of those obstacles. He didn't settle for what the world told him he should be doing. In fact, earlier in his career, he was approached by P.T. Barnum to come and join the circus, because a hundred years ago, that's what the expectation for someone like him would have been. But he didn't settle, and when he passed away, he passed away with a five-figure estate, which by today's standards would have made him a millionaire not just getting through the difficulties, but using those difficulties to create a lasting benefit. And like I said, this is a very biblically-based principle. Um, you can think of many examples in the Bible of people who turned their negatives into positives, who turned um, their defeats into victories, not settling to be the victims, but rather become the victor. So let's get into uh, the first part of the book of James. Starting in uh, chapter 1, and in verse 2, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. <clears throat> Consider it pure joy. I think there's a couple things we need to highlight real quick, seemingly obvious, but worth, worth discussing. The first thing is it doesn't say if you face trials, it says when you face trials, whenever. Trials are something we all have come to know, but it's something we have to expect will come again, um, especially as Christians. 
And in knowing that these trials are going to come, we know that we can prepare ourselves for how to deal with them. The second thing I think we need to establish and get out of the way is that the nature of these trials are various. James says they are trials of many kinds. And I think we're all familiar with this concept too. Trials come in all different shapes and sizes. Large and small, um, of a short period of time, a long period of time. There are trials that I could be going through and you could be going through and they can be the exact same thing, the exact same set of trials, but they affect us differently. Um, because that's the nature of who we are, the nature of being a human. And in that, in that vein, a lot of the trials that we go through are solely because we are humans. Everybody deals with them. We all deal with sickness, we deal with accidents, we deal with disappointments, we deal with death. And from a certain perspective, and I'm hesitant to use the word easier, but from a certain perspective, these type of trials can often be easier. And again, I, I want to put that in perspective. But what I mean by that is everybody in the world can understand where, these, where the pain from this comes from. You can go to your neighbor who doesn't necessarily b believe in what the Bible has to say, and they can sympathize, they can empathize with the things that you're going through, because everybody understands what it feels like to, to either lose somebody or go through sickness. So from that perspective, they can often be easier to deal with. But other trials, and the trials that are often more difficult to deal with, are the trials that we go through because we are Christians, because we've chosen to give our life to God, and because we've made a commitment to him. And in doing so, that paints a giant target on our backs, and Satan sees us as his first, uh, his first target of who he wants to go after. Satan fights us, he opposes us, and therefore we can expect trials. Um, kind of an example of this, and uh, something we're all kind of familiar with, but especially those of us with young kids right now, um, dealing with kids growing up in the world today seemingly is a lot different than it was 5, 10, 15 years ago. Um, just the, uh, the overabundance of the sexualization and uh, you know, not knowing what gender is what, and it's, it's a scary thing to raise kids in right now. And it's, it's something that everybody in this room, we can talk about, we can understand, and we can rely on each other. But you go outside these walls, and it's, it's not so certain that people can understand where you're coming from. Um, and in today's world, having Christian morals often paints you as somebody who's filled with hate rather than filled with God's love and God's morals. So that's something we have to keep in mind. And that's why it's so important that we're here tonight why we rely on each other and we, we gather together when these doors are open and we lean on each other and encourage one another and bear each other's burdens. So when we're going through trials, what is the Christian's response supposed to be according to James? He says, consider it, some of your versions may say count it, but consider it pure joy. Now, I don't know about you, but this does not strike me as a reasonable request. Now, I would never suggest that our following God, our following what the Bible has to say, should ever be based on what we think is reasonable. Um, but a lot of what the Bible asks us seems pretty clear and straightforward. Thou shalt not kill. That, that's an easy one. I can grasp that. Thou shalt not steal. That's an easy one, too. Have joy when you're going through trials. That's a little bit harder, a little bit more difficult. And I think the reason for that is that is not a natural reaction to dealing with our problems. Whenever we go through trials, it is our first instinct to feel that we are entitled to our sadness, that we're owed our sadness. But you can look at several examples throughout um, the Bible, and especially the New Testament, of people exhibiting joy in the midst of their trials. You look at examples, uh, for instance, in Acts chapter 5, verse 41, the apostles, right after being released from prison, it says, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. They rejoiced because they felt worthy of suffering disgrace. Well, that doesn't seem natural. You look at Paul, many examples of Paul, sitting in a jail cell, not knowing if today was going to be his last day alive, not knowing if he was ever going to get out, not knowing what type of punishment he was going to have to face the next day, sitting down and writing letters to fellow Christians saying, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Seems kind of silly, to be honest. <clears throat> so let's look at the text a little bit closer to see if we can get a better understanding of what this is trying to say. 
When you look at verse 2, to me, the most interesting word that pops out is the word consider. It says, consider it pure joy. And this is a word that's translated to mean consider, suppose, deem, account, or think. Pretty straightforward uh, translation and definition. To me, it's this idea of taking in information that you have at your disposal and um, making some type of assessment making a calculation. You have all this information at your grasp, you think about it, you consider it in order to help you make a decision. Um, however, this word is often also translated um, into a different meaning. It's also translated to mean to lead, to command, or to have rule over. Now you may look at that and think, well that's, that seems kind of, kind of silly, those, those don't really mean the same thing, but I would Suggest if you think about it long enough they, that it's two sides of the same coin. Um, in, in the English, we have different words to kind of break this concept apart, but in the Greek, it's all kind of wrapped up into one. This is step one and step two of, of a shared process. So you take in, like I said, take in the information, you consider it, you think about it, and once you've made a decision, what do you do? You lead with that decision that you've made. If you have other people at your, at your command, so to say, you lead them with that decision. If you don't, you can lead yourself with that decision. But this, it's this idea of taking into account what you know and making a decision and leading forward. So what are we being told here? Well, I think what it's saying is joy is not something that will naturally emanate from our trials. It's something that we have to consciously seek out. We're being asked to make an assessment and lead ourselves to what most people would consider an unpopular decision. And once we've accounted for all the information, we're called to choose joy. Now, do you think that James is telling us that we are not allowed to be sad? I think that's an interesting question. But I don't think that's necessarily what he's trying to say. And I'm going to I'll go back to the scripture here. I don't necessarily think he's trying to tell us that we're not allowed to be sad. Um, I think what he's saying is that we are to refuse to allow our trials to define who we're going to be and who we're going to become. Um, you know, it's interesting that he says, I mentioned I thought the word consider was interesting. He doesn't say be joyous or have joy. He says think about having joy. Take into consideration joy. And as we get into the later verses, we're going to understand why he says that and why that's something we need to choose. Uh, but it's a call to show the joy that we have in Christ. And I think a lot of times when we talk about joy, you know, joy can mean a lot of different things. Uh, joy is, is sometimes there's small things to have joy about. There's large things to have joy about. Often when we think of joy in this context, we think of, well, I'm going through the trial, so I'm, you know, it's my joy. But often it's sharing joy with other people. Some of you uh, may remember Bogan Smith. Um, Bogan was a longtime member here at Woodland Oaks, and he, he passed away a few years ago. Um, but if you knew Bogan at all, if you knew him well, you probably got a phone call on your birthday. Bogan made it a habit of going through the directory and uh, calling everyone and singing happy birthday to them. Um, and I had the kind of unique, uh, unique pleasure of sharing a birthday with Bogan. We had the same birthday. Um, so every year I would get a phone call and get an annual rendition of happy birthday to us. And it was something that was always special to me. Well, one time, uh, and I don't remember why he was in the hospital, but uh, he was in the hospital, and, and Kendra and I went to go visit him. And uh, kind of side story, we got there, and you know, we didn't know what room he was in, so we, you know, we asked the front desk where Bogan Smith was, and they, you know, there, there's no Bogan Smith here. Um, and she said, are you talking about Pleasant? Apparently his name was Pleasant Smith, which I thought, I thought was interesting, but that, that's a side story. But anyway, we got up to the room, and we walked inside, and the, well, the door was open. Um, so we kind of looked in, knocked a little bit, and noticed he wasn't in his bed. Uh, but rather, he was sitting at, um, there was like a built-in desk that was facing the window. And uh, kind of knocked on the door, and he, he kind of gave the head tilt and finger in the air, the kind of universal signal for, just give me, give, me, give me just one minute. And Bogan was sitting there from his hospital room making his phone calls, wishing people a happy birthday. And that always stuck with me. I thought that was kind of fascinating. Um, you know, and that's this concept of finding joy in the time of our trials. Um, a lot of times, you know, we find ourselves sitting in a hospital bed thinking, you know, when, when is so-and-so going to bring me this or when is so-and-so going to do that for me? 
finding joy in the time of our struggle. And not only finding joy for yourself, but finding joy in sharing it with other people. So as we go through this uh, blueprint um, tonight that James is giving us, let me go on, of turning trials into triumph, the first step in turning trials into triumph is purposefully and intentionally adopt a joyful attitude. And like I said, it's not something that's just going to happen. It requires a willful intent. It's something we have to consciously seek out. So I think the natural follow-up question to this is, well, why? What's, what's, what's the benefit? What's the point? Yeah, I can find joy, but why would I want to do that? Well, James provides us with the answer to that in verse 3. And he says, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Um, so I think a couple things we need to understand about, about this. Um, the first thing is that what this is saying is trials that we go through is a test on our faith. Um, you can see in verse 2, he's talking about whenever you face trials, he immediately follows up with because you know that the testing of your faith. So trials are a form of test on our faith. And the other thing is a tested faith can bring out the best in us and can, can have a positive result. Think of, uh, you ever seen a video of uh, uh, gold being melted down, fire purifying gold? You have this seemingly, you know, you have a solid object, seemingly relatively pure, but in order for it to be truly purified, it has to be completely broken down, completely melted. Once it's solidified, it can be stronger, it can be more pure. Same thing with um, an athlete. And for any of you coaches out there, I, when I played uh, high school sports, one of the most annoying things a coach could say is pain is gain. You're all familiar with that. Um, and uh, it, since high school, I've, I've become a little bit of a, of a weightlifting expert, so let me share some, some advice with you. Um, but, you know, think of somebody who's working out and lifting weights. The whole process of lifting weights is the idea of you're just ripping your muscle tissue and muscle fibers. You're ripping them apart with the idea that once you give them time to rest, they will build back stronger than they were before. And in fact, I saw, um, this doesn't have anything to do with my lesson, but I saw a video this week online that was floating around of, of a guy. Um, he thought it was a really good idea that he was going to run a marathon. And then when he was done running the marathon, he was going to propose to his, his longtime girlfriend. And he runs this race, and he gets to the end. He sees his buddy that's holding the ring. He grabs the ring, and he goes to get down on a knee, and his body just collapses. He couldn't hold his own weight. And so his two friends had to hold him up so he could, he could finish. But that's the idea of when you're working your muscles, you're, you're, you're breaking yourself down in order to build yourself back up stronger than you were before. And I think this concept is also... Uh, apparent in uh, this verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, says, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And I think this answers that how question that we talked about earlier, or that why question. Why have, why have joy in the midst of our troubles? Well, because we know that the testing of our faith works to our benefit, not against us. And we also know that trials rightly used or used correctly can produce a positive outcome. Uh, 2 Corinthians says that positive outcome is an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. I think another way to put this is enduring the cause allows us to reap the rewards of the effect. And I think in, in the case of Second Corinthians, the effect is that eternal glory. But in the case of James, what we're talking about, that effect is perseverance. And a tested faith, as it says, produces perseverance. Now you see this word perseverance pop up a lot in the New Testament. Some of your Bibles may say patience, some of them may say endurance. Um, and this is the word in the Greek, hupomone, which is most often, often translated um, as patience, perseverance, or endurance. Um, and, uh, you know, in my mind, there's, there's some differences between these, but for, for the sake of this lesson, they all kind of get uh, translated into the same thing. Um, but this is a word that is actually a compound Greek word. The first uh, word is hupo, which means under. The second word, meno, which means to remain or to abide. So it's this idea uh, to remain under is this idea of endurance. Um, now, I mentioned earlier that I'm a little bit of a weightlifting aficionado. 
Um, this is a picture of me. Um, Kendra took this. We, we took a trip to Tokyo last summer, and this is the. She took this picture of me. But this idea of perseverance and to remain under makes me think of this weightlifter,、um, holding that weight above his head, remaining under that weight as long as he possibly can.、Um, you can think,、uh, you know, the easiest thing to do in a situation where you have such a weight and such a burden above your head is just to drop it and let it go. Um, but this weightlifter knows that the longer he holds that up there, the bigger the reward is going to be, and the more better off he's going to be because of that.、Um, this idea of perseverance, as we see it in the Bible, notes the ability to exhibit steadfastness in the face of our most formidable difficulties, and it's something that takes a lot of courage. We have to have courage in order to persevere in the face of suffering. But this quality of perseverance is something that can only come through experiencing trials. I think that's an important note that we're going to touch on a little bit more. In order to gain perseverance, we have to go through and experience trials.、Um, so we go back to our checklist of our blueprint that James is providing for us. Step two is acknowledge that perseverance is the product of a tested faith. Another follow-up question: So what? What's the point of developing perseverance? What value does perseverance do for us? What is the value in it? Well, let's go to back to the back to the word. Verse four says, "Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything." To truly turn our trials into triumph, we have to let perseverance finish its work. Now, that's a weird way to phrase that, if you ask me.、Um, uh, let perseverance finish its work. James is personifying perseverance. There's your. Nightly alliteration. He's personifying perseverance. It's almost like perseverance is this living and breathing thing that you know kind of lives in a cabin by itself and is hard at work building something. You just got to give it time. When it's done, it's going to be really good. Let perseverance finish its work. I think too often we do our absolute best to try to get rid of our trials and difficulties and get them over with as quickly as we possibly can. We see that struggle coming, and we immediately look for all the exits. How am I going to get out of this? We see that storm coming, and we turn the other direction. But I think there are times in life when the best course of action is to bear up under that trial, and to persevere, to remain underneath it as long as we can, in order to build that perseverance. For when perseverance has had an opportunity to work, it produces. Maturity.、Um, think back to this picture、um, of of the weightlifter. It's not me, by the way. It's it's he、uh, it, it, it it yeah. Anyway, I didn't want anyone to be confused. It's 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 not me. He's a lot shorter.、Um, <laughs> but you think of this picture of this weightlifter and、um, his maturity as a weightlifter is solely dependent on whether he has persevered. Through his work, he can't get to the point where he's standing in the Olympics unless he's put in the time and persevered through that time.、Um, the weightlifter allows perseverance to do its work by coming back to the gym each and every day. It's a continuous process, over and over and over. He doesn't let that stop him. <clears throat> But we cannot reach spiritual maturity without first persevering through trials. And we cannot persevere through trials unless we pick up the weight in the first place. It's often way too easy to see a struggle coming and avoid it and run away. But we cannot persevere, and we cannot reach that spiritual maturity.、Um, and Sean's been talking a lot about spiritual maturity in his Sunday morning lessons. But we cannot get to the point where we call ourselves spiritually mature unless we've been tested. We've had our faith tested. And I think this example of the weightlifter、um, is a good reminder, a good image for that. We have to oftentimes pick up that weight that we've been avoiding in order to persevere through it. Instead of grumbling and complaining and allowing ourselves to become the victim of our own struggles, we have to patiently endure the trial, continuing our faith and continuing to build on our faith. Now, Jordan, Jordan mentioned last week that、uh, you often see the word、uh, "perfect" pop up at the Book of James and. Some of your versions may, rather than the word mature, it may say the word perfect. 
Um, but like he said last week, this isn't a word that we're talking about perfection. We're talking about sinlessness. We're talking about this idea of being complete, being made whole, being mature. And uh, you see this word used many times throughout the New Testament um, to talk about and specifically reference people who've gained that spiritual maturity, people who are no longer babes in Christ. Um, but such maturity can only come when perseverance has had time to do its work. So step three in our checklist is give perseverance time to do its work. Got another follow-up question for you. Well, how? I mentioned before when we were talking about lemons, um, this is a pretty simple process to understand. We've been hearing it our whole lives. You know, try to make those negatives and turn them into positives. Um, but it's often very difficult to practice. It's very difficult. It's almost like we need a little bit of wisdom to help us along the way. So let's go back to James. Starting in verse 5, this is what James has to say. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Um, especially that last part. These are pretty strong words. Um, but he's telling us to ask God. Now, at first glance, if you're reading all this kind of, uh, you know, through, you have this really meaty section of scripture that's talking about having joy through trials, persevering, gaining maturity, and then all of a sudden it says, by the way, if you lack wisdom, here's a suggestion. And at first glance, it may seem uh, a little out of place. Um, but I want uh, to make clear that wisdom is a very key component in all of this. In order to get through trial, we need to have the wisdom to do so. And what James is telling us is if we lack that wisdom, that we need to ask God for it, as he's promised to give it to us liberally. Now, you're, I don't know if you're allowed to stand in front of a group of Christians and talk about wisdom without referencing Solomon. Um, but we all know the example of Solomon. All he had to do was ask for it, and God gave it to him in an incredibly abundant amount. So when we're talking about wisdom, I, I do want to make a, a quick distinction here. Um, when we're talking about wisdom, we're not talking about knowledge. Um, knowledge involves information, it involves facts. Wisdom is the ability to properly use those facts in the most expeditious way. Um, so in the case of the context of what we're talking about with James, um, knowledge is God's word, it's the Bible. And the wisdom to properly, properly use that knowledge, the wisdom to use his word, can be received by asking God for that wisdom. Um, but I also think it's important to note that this isn't just any kind of prayer that he's talking about. Um, he says in verse 6, But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. It's almost as if it's not even worth our time to ask for it if we're not going to believe that God can give it to us. Um, in other words, I'm, I'm, I'm going to phrase this doubtless prayer. This is doubtless prayer that we need to ask God for the wisdom to get through our trials with a joyous attitude. Um, otherwise, as uh, verse 7 says, that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. And such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Pretty strong words from James, but it's important to remember that when we pray, we need to believe that God is going to deliver on what he's promised. Um, so step four in our blueprint for turning trials into triumph, ask for wisdom through doubtless prayer. So a little bit of a recap. Step one, purposefully and intentionally adopt a joyful attitude. Like I said, it's something we have to consciously seek. It's something we have to have intent on finding. Step two, acknowledge and persevere. Acknowledge that perseverance is the product of a tested faith. And that in order to get that perseverance, our faith has to be tested. And in that testing, step three, give perseverance time to work. Give perseverance the opportunity to do what it needs to do to get us to where our goals are and that spiritual maturity. And then step four, ask for wisdom through doubtless prayer. Um, and I really appreciate the, the way that James puts, puts uh, this part of Scripture together because he goes through, and like I said, it's really meaty Scripture right here, really uh, involved, very practical. And then um, after all that uh, intense uh, 
um, uh, language, he gives us an example of how to apply uh, what we just learned. So in James chapter 1, starting in verse 9, he says, Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should, give, should, the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossom falls, and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Um, so it's this interesting juxtaposition that uh, James is presenting to us. He's providing this, this example of people going through trials, trying to exhibit joy through those trials from the perspective of someone who's rich and someone who is poor. Um, in, in verse 9, when it says believers in humble circumstances, that's a reference to, to physically being poor. Now you think about, um, and you can think about in your own life, people you know, think about examples from the Bible, but people in poverty who go through intense trials and intense struggles are often tempted to do what? They're often tempted to curse God and blame God. God, you did this to me, this is your fault. Um, you think of Job's wife, that's, that's the example that came to mind. When they had lost everything, what was her response to Job? curse God and die. Um, and in, in, on the flip side of that, in wealth, um, they're not often tempted to curse God, but oftentimes they're tempted to forget God. You think of the, the Israelites going through the, the cyclical nature of the, the kings and the judges and this up and down nature of believing and not believing. When things were going well uh, financially, things were going well for, the ki for, for their kingdom, they would often forget God and forget about what he has done for them. But the example that James is giving us is that both poverty and in wealth, there are potential for problems. But regardless of the problems that we may be going through, there is always opportunity to see the joy. In verse 9, he says, Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. Um, well, what does he mean by high position? Um, the, the way I see this is, and, and like I said before, humble, believers in humble circumstances is talking about those who are in poverty. Um, and in the high position that he's referring to is people who are spiritually wealthy, who are spiritually rich. Because you can have absolutely nothing to your name. You can have zero dollars in your bank account and still be an heir to the greatest treasure this world will ever know. And one that will endure forever. If we are poor that we can rejoice in the fact that we have been exalted. And you see examples all throughout the, the Bible and all throughout the New Testament of God choosing the poor as a good reference point to exhibit those who are rich in faith, who are spiritually wealthy. Um, in fact, a, a little bit of a spoiler for a couple weeks from now, but in James chapter 2, verse 5, it says, Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith, and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him. Even if poor, we can still be spiritually rich and on par with all other Christians. And then on the flip side of that, in verse 10, he provides kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. He says, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation. If we're rich, then we can take pride and we can rejoice in the fact that we have been humbled. And, and what, is, what does that mean? That's kind of a, an odd way of putting that. Uh, but I think what he's saying here is uh, what, one of the central focuses, the central tenets of being a, a Christian is, is what? Being a servant. Lowering yourself to the level of being a servant. Doesn't matter how wealthy you are, our goal in life as Christians is to serve. Not only God, but to serve each other. Um, so the rich are humbled by becoming a servant. And like I said before, the believers in humble circumstances can be elevated by their high position of spiritual wealth. Um, people who are physically wealthy can be humiliated and brought down um, by the fact that they are servants of God, putting them on par with all of the Christians regardless of their wealth. Um, and that's how the rich can be humbled, because riches are temporary, riches don't present any, any form of salvation. Um, even in trials of poverty or wealth, there's always cause for rejoicing and taking pride. And this idea places all Christians on a level playing field. Um, and that level playing field is at the foot of the cross. Exalting the poor who are rich in faith and humbling the wealthy because of their spirit of servanthood. 
Um, and I, like I said before, I like what James is doing here because it, it provides us with an example. Uh, but this principle applies across all spectrums of different types of situations. Um, it doesn't matter if you are young or old, healthy, not healthy, gifted, not gifted. The same principle applies. It doesn't matter where you are, what your station is in life. This blueprint that we went through, those four steps, is beneficial and applies to all in helping us find the joy in, in, in the circumstances we find ourselves in in this life. Um, and then we go on to verse 12 here. And in verse 12, um, this isn't, you know, uh, some, some people along the way when the, the Bible was being translated decided to put, uh, you know, chapter headings, chapters, verses. This isn't by any means the end of a, a chapter or a verse, but I feel like this summarizes everything we just talked about in a perfect way. This is blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised those who love him. Blessed is the one who perseveres. Like we mentioned, perseverance comes from enduring through our trials, having stood that test, testing of our faith, that the person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Which at the, at the end of the day, that's everybody in here. That's all of our goals. That sums up why we're here. Um, and that about wraps up uh, what, what my lesson was. Um, next week, uh, Jordan's going to be back. Um, uh, to, to, many, to many people's relief, he'll be back. And he'll be speaking on James and starting in verse 13 um, about temptations, dealing with temptations, the source of temptations. Um, before we close out in a prayer, does any, anybody have any, I kind of whipped through that pretty quickly, I uh, didn't really look up that often. Anybody have any comments, any, any questions that they'd like to, to, like to bring forward? All right. Covered it all. I like it. Well, let's pray and then, uh, then we can be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here tonight, to, to be with one another and to lift each other up and encourage one another. Um, we're so thankful to, to have the freedom to do so, and uh, God, we pray that we take advantage of the opportunities we get to spend time with one another. God, we're thankful for the word um, that you have. We're thankful for the men that, that wrote these words down that you, you breathed life into. We're thankful for the, the blueprint that James is giving us here, and we're, we're, we're mindful of the things that he's telling us. And God, we pray for the wisdom to, to put this into our lives and to apply it to our lives. We pray for the wisdom to seek out joy in times when it just seems impossible. And God, we know that our joy rests in you and the eternal promise that you've provided to us. And nothing that happens in this world can take that away from us. Because your promises stand greater and above anything this world could offer. God, help us to preserve in our times of struggle, per, to, to help us to, to get through the struggles and persevere and to have patience and endure through it so that we can be mature in, in faith and, and lead a, a faithful life in service to you. Um, God, we love you so much, and we're thankful for the gift of your son. We're thankful that, his, uh, that he lived on this earth, that he uh, lowered himself uh, from his high position and came to this earth um, to lead us and to teach us what it means to be a servant for you. And we're thankful that he died for us, and we're thankful that he rose and conquered death so that we could spend eternity with you. And we pray all these things in your son's most holy name. Amen. You're dismissed.